The final vote tallies from the annual shareholders meeting are in, and not only did Nelson Peltz lose, there was a shocking number of Disney shareholders that voted for greater political transparency for the company, and that didn't come from who you'd think it would. Let's talk about that on That Park Place. Hello, I am Jonas J. Campbell, an investigative reporter for That Park Place, and here with me is my Wookiee co-pilot, Mr. Vash Guy. Vash, are the atomic batteries to power? Uh, yes, and I just had to put a drop of, of uh, what's the what's the liquid again? I, let, I, let's I, say dilithium I, extract. <laughs> I, I gotta put that in the hyperspace uh, 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 engine. I'll, I'll be right back. Oh, coaxium. I, you mean I, that I, stuff I, that they made up for, uh, for Solo? Yeah, and there's somebody who knows the extended universe that's gonna say, no, coaxium existed in, in the Witches of, of uh, Dathomir uh, episode five or whatever. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm butchering these EU titles on purpose to be funny. I could go and look, but I'm not gonna go do that for this because we're talking about shareholder proposals here. Uh, that park place likes to cover the business side of things. And, and once the actual shareholder totals came in, we wanted to see who moved up and who moved down. Well, it looks like, uh, James Gorman is a little less shiny. He only came in with 97.45, of all shareholders saying that he definitely needs to be on the board. If, uh, of all of the board members that were up for election, everyone agrees that James Gorman should be on that board. I don't have any problem with that. In fact, I think I would have also voted for and not withheld on James P. Gorman, unless I was doing one of those big moves to say, no, none of these Walt Disney candidates are acceptable. Uh, Bob Iger getting 94%. Uh, Nelson Peltz getting a slight amount more of the vote. He moved up by 0.06%. So not a big deal. Uh, and, and it seems like the Walt Disney Company is secure with its current board members until there are greater moves in who holds shares in the company. That's not what we want to talk about today however uh if you attended the valiant renegade live stream i don't know if that's still up on youtube uh we reacted live to the shareholder proposals uh the first there were 10 of them all together the first three were ones that uh, were specifically proposed by the walt disney company i should say the first four because electing the, sh the uh, board of directors is the first one but uh, just a quick rundown of those pretty standard stuff electing the board as uh, proposal one Proposal two was ratifying their uh, independent registered public accounting firm. That's always been PwC. Probably needs to not be PwC for a little while. Just, you know, throwing that in there. Advisory to approve executive compensation. Uh, only 80% uh, voted for that one. So that oh. uh, did not have the uh, same vote of confidence that uh, some of the other proposals did. 88% uh, approved an amendment to the uh, restated stock incentive plan. That's pretty boring. Charitable contributions being disclosed. The Blackwells Group, uh, they wanted to, they, they put forward a proposal that basically said, well, if our guys get more than your guys, what if your guys can also still be on the board? It was a very strange proposal. So the ones that uh, we want to talk about here, of course, is the Trian Group proposal to repeal recent revisions to the company bylaws. That got a 29%, almost 30%. Uh, Peltz himself got more votes there. And uh, a lot of those procedural rules were changed probably to keep the Trian Group from getting board seats. But uh, there's two in particular that I wanted to talk about. Um, and one is more spicy, but one says more about the company right now. One was a proposal... I'm, I'm going to say it in the words that they do. I'm going to be a little bit more vague here. The shareholder proposal requesting a report on gender transitioning compensation and benefits. Uh, Miss Chloe Cole, who is a an activist at this point, um, she uh, was transitioned at an early age. She feels like she was duped by her doctors. And then when she wanted to go back, she did not get nearly the assistance that she did in going one direction. And she was brought in to call out the company for sponsoring one form of, of gender change, but not sponsoring the other form of gender change. We also know from the Reimagine Tomorrow campaign that that Disney wanted to make sure that not only were employees entitled to these benefits, but they wanted to make sure the employees knew that if their children, the children of employees wanted these benefits, they were making those available for children to receive these company benefits. We're not going to talk judgment either direction on that. Um, you can probably guess on your own where we stand on that issue. Uh, 2% of shareholders voted for 
Disney to release a report saying what they pay for and what they do not pay for, and mm, probably uh, to change some of their existing policies on that. That is a uh, abysmally small number. So it seems like most shareholders on either side of the aisle on this issue are saying that's not something that they want the Walt Disney Company to be reporting on. No word on whether or not they would change the actual policies within the company, just the way that they report on them, if I'm understanding that correctly. Now, the reason for this video in general, other than going for these uh, the, these totals in general, is one proposal in particular, which was not related to Nelson Peltz, got a lot more attention than I thought it probably would. A shareholder proposal requesting a report on political expenditures. That is a nice short way of talking about the moment on the shareholders call when a woman got on and talked about how the Walt Disney Company needs to report more on who they donate to. Not Republicans, not Democrats, everyone in general, but she was very focused on shaming Bob Iger for supporting candidates that might stand on the opposite side of the abortion issue from what she believes the company stance should be. She wanted to know if the Disney company had ever or will ever donate to a pro-life candidate. And let's just say from the tone of the shareholders call, you could tell she was very angry that the company, that the Walt Disney Company, once a symbol of, of traditional American values, would ever donate to any candidate that had ever support, supported a pro-life position. Talk, she talked about the Capitol riots on uh, a certain date that we're not going to put into this video. But that proposal, and this is what very much surprised me, 25% of all voting shareholders want a complete report of political donations made by the Walt Disney Company, and they want that available to shareholders, which essentially means that they want a full public report of who Disney donates to. Vash, what do you think would be done with that information if it came came to the light of day? Well, uh, a lot more shareholder scrutiny, uh, uh, absolutely, and a lot more uh, shareholder criticism, maybe even some media criticism on who they actually donate to and for what causes they donate for. And honestly, I mean, it's a, it's a big question for shareholders right now. Who actually runs the Walt Disney Company? Who are they? A media company? Are they a lobbying firm? You know what 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 business are they into uh, with a lot of their little campaign donations. I, I, it's ironic because I believe in 2022, there are some sites out there uh, that show this information. But uh, when Chapek said, oh, we're not a left-leaning or right-leaning company. We're just we're just producing media for the masses. That's all. Well, at that point in that year, they uh, disproportionately donated from, from, from to one political party from the other in a massive, massive way right here. So I think a lot of, uh, I think transparency in general I think it's a good thing, whether it be the Walt Disney Company or otherwise, uh, but especially with the Walt Disney Company, especially as it engages in family entertainment primarily. Uh, yeah, I think uh, because politics can be such a political uh, or a divisive issue, uh, I think it's very appropriate that they come out with a full report. And I think that's why you saw a, a, a lot of shareholders interested in a proposal like that. We've heard this proposal in, in prior um, uh, shareholders meetings before, uh, but I don't think that it's ever gotten this much vote share. Right. And, and to just speak about the uh, w what happened in 2020 uh, and to have everyone stuck at home, but also have inciting incidents that don't have anything to do with the reasons that people were stuck at home. But of course, they're related because everyone was glued to their televisions to try to find out what was going on in the world. Maybe there was a maybe that there was a catalyst out there that caused some of these other issues to become a big deal. And then the Walt Disney Company, uh, again, uh, the the amazing work that was done by Christopher Rufo exposing some uh, some comments made by Bob Iger saying that it was the duty of the company, uh, specifically around the January events, we must comment on political issues because they aren't really political issues. They are moral issues, to quote him. Uh, I think this is a point at which the company internally said, no, we are in go going to be engaged in politics, which is always a fascinating to thing to see uh, people like Bob Iger redefine terms. Of course, uh, redefinition of terms came into that other proposal that only got 2% as well. There's all kinds of things that don't mean exactly what they mean on face value. In fact, sometimes they mean the opposite here. I think this is a, 
I think that the Walt Disney Company and surveys have shown that the Walt Disney Company has increase, increasingly become a more divisive uh, organization here as they are a mass market company. They are supposed to be a general entertainment and theme park company that is supposed to market to as many people as possible because their business model with their big four quadrant pictures or intended to be big four quadrant pictures, those need to appeal to as many people as possible theme park oh, yeah. need to uh, cater to as many people as possible in order for this to work. Now, if you want to have a theme park that specifically caters to one political party, you're automatically cutting off half of your audience here. If you want to lobby with one specific political party, I think that cuts off a lot for half of the nation and anyone outside of America that happens to believe in those values or has, let's say, more traditional American values lining up with maybe some random set of values from from other countries that uh, maybe not as maybe not be as progressive as say the west coast of the country tends to be i think that disney is in a is in a world of hurt if they continue down this path with 25% of all voting shareholders one in four shareholders saying no 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 we want a full report on your political expenditures and who you are supporting in all aspects here i don't know that that is necessarily one party saying that, oh, no, we want to know what's going on. The person calling for it was not the person I would have expected, because obviously Disney has been a political football on either side at this point. And specifically, there there are people who have run for the presidency of the United States that probably would propose something similar for the Walt Disney Company. I don't think shareholders are smart to vote for something like this. I think that damages the company's brand. I'm talking far too long on what is actually a very simple issue here. Disney needs to get away from politics. If you're going to be a lifestyle brand, be a Target, be an Apple. Apple, a company that I don't think anybody questions where the high levels of that company stand politically, but it does not affect the way that their product is sold or marketed. People have a feeling that that California company might have some political aspects to it, but no one cares because it's not the primary message of the company. Vash, I've talked too long here. What do you have to say? Oh, it's a fair point. I mean, look, uh, I remember hearing the expression before uh, Crest Toothpaste sells uh, their product to people on death row. Uh, it's just their ability to move product is what is going to be the key aspect for a shareholder value in return right there. So why why cater to one specific subgroup you know, to another when, especially when you have product that's so expensive to produce and you're asking for a, a pretty pretty good sum for it. Uh, this is what Nelson Peltz was talking about uh, during uh, that big interview that we saw, I believe in what, uh, Fortune? Uh, or, financial, or, uh, Times. financial Times. Financial Times, yes. I do apologize. He was talking about, look, listen, you know, is it necessarily right for a company like Ben & Jerry's, for example, to get into the political argument the, 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 as much as they have, or the political discourse, I should say, as much as they have when they should be selling ice cream. <laughs> and look, the Walt Disney Company, this was a unifying brand at one point. And even Bob Iger has at least said, oh yeah, hey, uh, you know, some of the more activists driven in the company or organization, he's told them, hey, look, we have to focus on story rather than rather than messages. Now, whether or not they're consistent with that is a whole other story, but at least the the argument is 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 out there, at least some form. Look, these these were previously cultural institutions that you had that brought people together. Why use that same product to tear people apart and to cater from one side to the other? Look, uh, I you know I've had this conversation with other people before, and the way it's been described to me, and, and is the most simplistic explanation is if you have groups A, B, or C, and you put out a product that only appeals to A, well then you're sh shutting yourself out to a large segment of, of the market, obviously, as you said, Jonas. So why wouldn't you appeal to at, at least as much as reasonably possible to all three uh, groups? It's just it it. It really does make no sense. Uh, they got to get out of politics. They got to step away from that. I think transparency is a good thing in that it would at least, uh, you know, maybe enable them to step back from the political campaign contributions and so forth, getting so heavily invested into, into, into politics the way they have been behind closed doors. Maybe a little sunlight would help in this fashion, but who knows? 
I don't know. You you've just said something that I think is probably a little controversial to our audience there. Should they be more transparent? Should they back away or should they just go back to what they used to do and donate a little bit to everyone so they stay on everyone's good side? Leave a comment below. Let us know your thoughts on this situation. Uh, I always love to see what our our very intelligent audience likes to tell us because we usually miss something here uh let us know in the comment section down below like this video if you like this video and consider subscribing to that park place for all the news that should be fun thanks for watching that park place news for more information consider checking out www.thatparkplace.com and don't forget to subscribe share like and send this out on your favorite social media accounts